welcome back Kingdom Living Community. Welcome to Riding the Storms. And today you are going to be so blessed because it will be a continuation um, of the major judges today. So get your notebooks, get your pens, get ready because Jesse's going to walk us through the scriptures and continue on with our learning in that area. And before we get started, while you're gathering things together, a few reminders. Um, you all have heard kingdom living with jesse.com now but some of you might have forgotten about illuminate the darkness.com oh my goodness so if you would like to support uh, that ministry to the whistleblowers to our champions go to illuminate the darkness.com and you can click on donate and there will be an entire list of the different ministries that are composed in illuminate the darkness but you can click on donate now and then there's a drop down button that allows you to select champions so there's different things in that list including the netherlands including um uh, vet a veteran project but specifically for the whistleblowers you want to select champions and then you can follow through the rest of the way to make your donation online or if you're old school, like many of us are, you can actually write a check out and send it to Illuminate the Darkness. And that address is P.O. Box 10443, Fargo, North Dakota, 58106. Again, that's P.O. Box 10443. Fargo, North Dakota, 58106. And then that will get taken right in for those programs. Um, so again, illuminatethedarkness.com slash donate now. And that's where you'll, you'll find that out. So Jesse, oh my goodness, that was so robust to the discussion on the major and minor judges and just going through what it means to be a judge. And you started everything off with the Lord is the yeah. judge and, and showed from, from, from that standpoint, his standpoint, what does it mean? And then taking that to the children of Israel and the, and the judges that were, that were risen up. And uh, so I'm excited to keep, keep going with the major judges because last week was wow. Yeah. And absolutely, you know, keep in mind what's most interesting is that, you know, we see in a lot of these verses just how military focused that position of judge is. And, you know, it's interesting as you read through scripture, um, you know, the Lord presented himself in that position as a judge with military conquest in mind. You know, he said to Abraham, he said to Isaac and Israel, you know, I will give you this land. And he promised them land and that they would have authority in that land. Yet we see Israel who, you know, is looking at the other nations instead of a God who's leading them per se, you know, they see the, the king is associated with the military conquest and, and they begin to cry out for that king. Um, so, you know, there's kind of this dual position where, you know, instead of receiving the Lord and, and desiring him alone to fill every need for them, you know, in that area of governing and authority, they begin to cry out for somebody to fill that spot. So that's where we see, you know, all these major and minor judges, kind of the Lord raises them up uh, for these seasons as Israel is going through um that time of difficulty and stuff so let's start we're going to cover the last four of the major judges and starting from the beginning you know let's go over again those major judges are uh joshua uh you also kind of have eli and samuel in there who we're not necessarily going to cover because uh those are entire books in scripture uh you have othniel ehud and you have Deborah with Barak, her general. So those are the ones we covered in the first episode. Now today we'll get to the last four, which are uh, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, and Shemgar. So let's start with Gideon. We're going to turn to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to read straight through. So if you will read all of chapter 6, 
I'll pick up and read chapter seven, and then I'll let you finish with chapter eight. Okay. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord, your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat and with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the bread with the tip of the staff in his hand and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, put down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord, your God, here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as the fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. 
So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded, but he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. But Joash shout, shouted to the mob and confronted him. Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by mourning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jerubbaal. Baal, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. Soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and all of them responded. Then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me, but let me make this one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. <laughs> yeah, so some interesting things we begin to see with Gideon. And you know, first, I mean, I just see the image in my head that, you know, these men in the city are kind of going about their business. They're like, mm -hmm. you know, like they normally do. All of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, like what <laughs> happened to the Astaroth pool? And there's a, a bull burning, you know, like who did this? Who tore down the altar, you know? And they're just shocked, you know, and they're like, you know, scandalous. How could Gideon do such a thing the son of joash you know and it says that they actually became hostile you know very violent and and uh you know and that's where you know his father said no let Baal come and contend for himself you know if he's a god let him contend for himself and um you know so it just gets very interesting as you you know see some of these elements come out and and you know, we see that, you know, what were some of the things that the Lord called Gideon to do? He called him to tear down the altars and to uproot the strongholds of, you know, the, the idol worship that was in that area. So that's something that judges are appointed and called to do is to take care of those altars and, um, you know, to draw the people back into a relationship with God and not to be, you know, within the idol worship. Um, so let's get further. We'll get into chapter seven here with Gideon. It says early in the morning, uh, Jeroboam or Gideon and all his men camped at the spring at Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the, here, the hill of Moriah. Um, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. 
Um, you know, so you've got his armies there. I think he had 32,000 men. And the Lord says, that's too many. If, if you go into battle to conquer the Midianites, you know, Israel's going to say they, they won the battle on their own strength. So the Lord says, now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. I mean, that's a huge amount, 22,000 that left. Um, so I guess, yeah, so he had 32,000, 10 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took their provisions and trumpets of the others. So it's interesting when you think of that, you know, I, when I was younger, I asked the Lord, why did he, what was the difference? And I guess, you know, when you think of position or posture that those who kneel down and are dipping their head into the water, they're not looking at the areas around them. Their eyes are off the battlefield versus those that, you know, bring the water up and are lapping, they're still able to see everything going on. So that's why the Lord chose only those who kept their eyes on the battle and on what was going on. So now the camp of Midian lay below in the valley. And during that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. And listen to what they are saying. And afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura sent his servant or his servant went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the other eastern people had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. He said, I had a dream. Um, a round loaf of barley bread came tr tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. Now, it's interesting when you think about that, like think of some of the symbology in this you know, like you're like, oh, like a loaf of bread, right? <laughs> but what had been Gideon's fleece? Like he had laid down a fleece and asked for the dew, which we're told in scripture that the manna fell like dew. So it goes all right. the way back to the manna, the gathering of the word that fell like dew. Wow. And so Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation. He bowed down and he worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he said, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just after they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding on in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. <laughs> when the 300 trumpets sounded, 
and the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shittah, um, toward Zerara, or Zerara? Yeah, we'll <laughs> put it like that. As far as the border of Abel, Mahola, near Tabith, Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Bara. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Bara. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb, who killed Oreb, or sorry, they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the wine press of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. All right, so onward to Judges 8. Wow. Oh my goodness. I love, I love Gideon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> then the people of Ephraim asked Gideon, why have you treated us this way? Why didn't you send for us when you first went out to fight the Midianites? And they argued heatedly with Gideon. But Gideon replied, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't even the leftover grapes of Ephraim's harvest better than the entire crop of my little clan of Abiezer? God gave you victory over Oreb and Zeb, the commanders of the Midianite army. What have I accomplished to compare to that? When the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, their anger subsided. Gideon then crossed the Jordan River with his 300 men, and though exhausted, they continued to chase the enemy. When they reached Succoth, Gideon asked the leaders of the town, please give my warriors some food. They are very tired. I am chasing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. But the officials of Sukkot replied, catch Zeba and Zalmunna first, and then we will feed your army. So Gideon said, after the Lord gives me victory over Zeba and Zalmunna, I will return and tear your flesh with the thorns and briars from the wilderness. From there, Gideon went up to Peniel and again asked for food, but he got the same answer. So he said to the people of Peniel, after I return in victory, I will tear down this tower. By the time Ziba and Zalmunna were in Karkar with about 15,000 warriors, all that remained of the allied armies of the east for 120,000 had already been killed. Gideon circled around by the caravan route east of Noba and Jogbaha, taking the Midianite army by surprise. Ziba and Zalmunna, the two Midianite kings fled, but Gideon chased them down and captured all their warriors. After this, Gideon returned from the battle by way of the Harris Pass. There he captured a young man from Sukkot and demanded that he write down the names of all the 77 officials and elders in the town. Gideon then returned to Sukkot and said to the leaders, here are Ziba and Zalmunna. When we were here before, you taunted me saying, catch Ziba and Zalmunna first, and then we will feed your exhausted army. Then Gideon took the elders of the town and taught them a lesson, punishing them with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He also tore down the tower of Peniel and killed all the men in the town. Then Gideon asked Ziba and Zalmunna, the men you killed at Te Tabor, what were they like? Like you, they replied, they all had the look of a king's son. They were my brothers, the sons of my own mother, Gideon ex exclaimed. As surely as the Lord lives, I would kill you if you hadn't killed them. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword, for he was only a boy and was afraid. Then Ziba and Zalmunna said to Gideon, be a man, kill us yourself. So Gideon killed them both and took the royal ornaments from the necks of their camels. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers for you have rescued us from Midian. But Gideon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. However, I do have one request. 
that each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. The enemies being Ishmaelites all wore gold earrings. Gladly, they replied, they spread out a cloak and each one threw in a gold earring he had gathered from the plunder. The weight of the gold earrings was 43 pounds, not including the royal ornaments and pendants, the purple clothing worn by the kings of Midian or the chains around the necks of their camels. Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Ophrah, his hometown. But soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. That is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. Then Gideon, son of Joash, returned home. He had 70 sons born to him, for he had many wives. He also had a concubine in Shechem, who gave birth to a son whom he named Abimelech. Gideon died when he was very old, and he was buried in the grave of his father, Joash, at Ophrah, at the land of the clan of Ab Abiezer. As soon as Gideon died, the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping the images of Baal, making Baal bereath their God. They forgot the Lord, their God, who had rescued them from all their enemies surrounding them, nor did they show any loyalty to the family of Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, despite all the good he had done for Israel. Oh my goodness, what a groaner. Yeah a lot <laughs> there's a lot there <laughs> there is yeah. but i think you know we see i re i really appreciate that passage you know as we've talked about that judge position really being a military conquest position we see how even you know gideon in his connection with god you know the angel of the lord appeared and was you know directly speaking to him leading him in that conquest giving him exact battle plans telling him you know, how to position the people, um, how to have them, you know, conquer, take, take over. So there's a lot in that passage that we can learn about, um, you know, what it is to really be in that position of a judge. And, um, you know, so that one's really good. Um, next, we're going to get into Jephthah here um, in Judges 10. And we'll read Judges 10 through 11, uh, the chapters of that. So I'll start um, here with chapter 10, and we'll start with verse 6. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtaroths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead and the land of the Amorites. Uh, the Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim, and Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord and they said, we have sinned, forsaking our God and serving the balls. The Lord replied, when the Egyptians, the Ammonites and the, um, or the Amorites, the Ammonites and the Philistines, the Sidians and the Amalekites and the Moanites oppressed you and you cried to me for help. Did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods. So I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. And he, he could bear Israel's misery no longer. Then the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead. The Israelites assembled and called camped at Mizpah, the leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, whoever will take the lead in attacking the Ammonites, he will be um, the head over all who live in Gilead. So 
you know, we see there that as they cried out, you know, the Lord tells them, ah, you know, go call on your <laughs> idols and see if they're going to save you. And it was when the Lord said that he released them to go do their thing. You know, they knew that, that their idols were not real. They knew they weren't going to save them. And, you know, this passage or this verse right here, um, you know, where it says, let's see where it was. Um, you know, verse 16, then they got rid of their foreign gods among them and served the Lord. So there was, you know, literally where they were ridding themselves of everything that was not of God that was in their homes that they were worshiping. So that's a good lesson. You know, how do we, you know, how do you get the people back to that that righteous state with God, there has to be a getting rid of the idols or the things that they're worshiping. So, you know, we've talked about the judges, they tear down altars, uh, they help, you know, kind of govern the people. So this is another aspect. They guide the people in getting rid of things that they're worshiping in their homes or in their lives. So um, let's go on then um, with Jephthah here. Uh, chapter 11 um that's a long one so if you want to split like if you want to read to verse um why don't you read till verse 18 and i'll pick up from there okay now jephthah of gilead was a great warrior he was the son of gilead but his mother was a prostitute gilead's wife also had several sons and when these half brothers grew up they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a band of worthless rebels following him. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. The elders said, come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, the elders replied. If you lead us in the battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders, let me get this straight. If I come with you and the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, will you really make me ruler over all the people? The Lord is our witness, the elders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him their ruler and commander of the army. At Mitzvah, in the presence of the Lord, Jephthah re repeated what he had said to the elders. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon, say, asking, why have you come out to fight against my land? The king of Ammon answered Jephthah's messengers, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they stole my land from the Ammon River to the Jabbok River and all the way to the Jordan. Now then, give back the land peaceably. Jephthah sent this message back to the Ammonite king. This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not steal any land from Moab or Ammon. When the people of Israel arrived at Kadesh on their journey from Egypt after crossing the Red Sea, they sent messengers to the king of Edom asking for permission to pass through his land, but their request was denied. Then they asked the king of Moab for similar position, but he wouldn't let them pass through either. So the people of Israel stayed in Kadesh. Finally, they went around Edom and Moab through the wilderness. They traveled along Moab's eastern border and camped on the other side of the Arnon River. But they never once crossed the Arnon River into Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon and said to him, let us pass through your country to our own place. Sihon, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. 
Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and his whole army into Israel's hand, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from Arnon to the Jabbok, Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. Now, since the Lord God of Israel has driven the Ammonites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God Chemish gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon uh, and surrounding settlements and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute between us this day between Israel and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, If you give the Ammonites into my hand, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated twenty towns from Error to the vicinity of Minith, um, as far as Abel Kiramim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was his only child, except for her he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would not marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he vowed. And she was a virgin. And from this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah um, of Gilead. Yeah, so interesting, heavy. I mean, you wonder what did he think was going to come out of his house? You know, the first thing out of his house, you know. Right. It's not so like they had a cat. Yeah, that those words came out of his mouth and. You know, so in that, you know, wow. we're not encouraging people to make any vow of, you know, I think that's a, a real lesson, you know, like that you need to be careful what you vow to the Lord. And, you know, in that, I think we see don't, you know, don't make a vow to secure the victory to try to move God's hand in one way or another, um, because the Lord will hold accountable to that. So. Yeah, so very interesting passage. Um, now, Samson is a much longer story. We're not going to get into all of that, uh, but that starts in Judges 13. And um, we see like the first part, let's just read 13, 1 through uh, 16 here. It says, again, Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, you know, oh it's interesting gosh. to do a study to see how many times Israel, it was like, again, again, <laughs> again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And you're like, <laughs> when are they going to stop doing the evil, right? Mm -hmm. The Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zora named Manoah from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. 
Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So the Nazarites were those who were distinctly set apart for God and for his service. Um, then the women went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me and he looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will become pregnant and have a son. Now then drink no wine or other fermented drink. Do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I beg you to let the man of God you send to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife, and when he came to the man, he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, or eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not realize that it was an angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that we may honor you when your word comes true. He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell on with their faces to the ground when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things or now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Manoah Dan um, between Zorah and Eshtaol. So then if you read on, you can read uh, through chapter 16, you can read all the conquests of the things that God did through Samson um, because he had, you know, no wine and did not cut his hair. It said that he had exceptional strength, um, you know, and so there were some things, you know, one of the things that says he, um, you know, basically was upset about some things, the transaction that had happened with Israelites um, and sounds like a woman that uh, he wanted to marry and because he was mm -hmm. unwrongfully uh, dealt with in that situation, he took a lion's carcass, took the jawbone, and uh, there was a bees, um, a swarm of bees and some honey in there. It says he scooped out the honey with his hands and ate it along the way. And, uh, you know, so just some odd, interesting things that happen um, in his life that um, you know, we see that with his strength, he had one weakness, which was a woman. And, uh, you know, he sounds like he visited her often. Um, and she finally convinced him to uh, cut his hair. And, 
in that he lost his strength and uh, you know was taken captive by the Philistines and tied chained to these big pillars and it ends up you know as his hair grew as he was there for a while um, you know finally the Lord allowed him to have enough strength to pull um, that building down on top of all these Philistine leaders that gathered there and thus uh, the Philistines were judged uh, because of their evil and their wickedness. Now let's cover one more. We're going to go back to Judges 3. And we'll start off. That also is a couple passages long. On, um, on Shemgar here. But um, Judges 3 starting at verse 31. If you want to. Oh I guess it's just one verse for that passage. But go ahead. If you want to read that. <laughs> <laughs> After Ehud, Sham Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel. He once killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. I love this. We got, you know, jawbones and donkeys and. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. So want me to keep going? In yeah, go on to ver uh, chapter four. After Ehud's death. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to a king, Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king, the commander of his army was Sisera. And this is it. Do we want to keep going here, Jesse? Yeah, we're going to stop there because I think, yeah, I think this is blending a little bit with what we already read in the first of all of this about Sisera and Deborah and Barak. So let's see, it goes to five. So if you want to start chapter five and just read verses one through six. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. Israel's leaders took charge and the people gladly followed. Praise the Lord. Listen, you kings, pay attention, ye mighty rulers, for I will sing to the Lord. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you set out from Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled and the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord, the God of Mount Sinai, in the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, people avoided the main roads and travelers stayed on winding pathways. There were few people left in the villages of Israel. Until Deborah rose as a mother for Israel, when Israel chose new gods, were erupted at the city gates. Yet not a shield or spear could be seen among 40,000 warriors in Israel. My heart is with the commanders of Israel, with those who volunteered for war. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So we see he's just mentioned um, there, there were things before. Uh, right before Deborah went into place, uh, Shemgar was one of those judges that the Lord temporarily sent to rescue the people. So, you know, it's interesting to go through these, to look through, you know, what the Lord, you know, with each of these, it says the spirit of the Lord came upon them. The Lord gave them very specific things to do. Usually it had to do with battle, military conquest. And it had to do with securing the land. Um, you know, in that we see that, you know, they were sent to tear down the strongholds of wickedness to deal with the altars of Baal and Ashtaroth primarily. Um, you know, as they tore up those places of wickedness, many of them would establish an altar to the Lord in that place. You know, we saw Gideon who established the altar of Jehovah Shalom, God is our peace. And, um, you know, they they brought back the people's hearts to the Lord where, you know, the people had been stuck in idol worship and they, you know, what was the cause of their oppression? You know, what was the cause of, you know, them lacking blessings or goodness from God? It was because they had turned to worshiping idols. But once they, you know, turned away and they cleaned out their homes and they turned back to the Lord and started living like he desired them to live in that land, then we see that they had blessing and prosperity. 
So, you know, that's a that's a real uh, model for us, you know, as we look at our homes, our communities, you know, where where are things in our home? Are things, you know, are we experiencing the goodness, the prosperity that God intends for us? If not, the first thing we need to look at is, okay, where are the altars that we're worshiping at? You know, what gods are we worshiping other than the Lord? And we need to confess and turn away from those. Um, as we do that, you know, and come back into that right relationship, um, we're going to see that there there is blessings, there is goodness that God has for us. So, um, you know, I think that's the main thing, you know, as we think about this position is that, um, you know, really the judges are meant to, you know, take that look, look at, you know, why are the people having oppression? Why is there heaviness on the land? Um, you know, why are our enemies defeating us in, in things, you know, and as, as they look, you know, see what the sins are. What is the sin? It, you know, what's interesting is that with Baal and Ashtoreth being the most mentioned, the major sin there was a couple of things. One, sexual sins. Um, you know, those places, Baal and Ashtoreth poles were a place where you get a lot of the sexual sins. Um, you also have, you know, the sacrificing of children. And it might not be, you know, literal sacrifices that are happening in our home, but in what ways are we sacrificing our children or compromising? You know, are we giving them free access to materials, you know, where they're learning about homosexuality or transgenderism or, you know, different things like that? Are we, um, you know, not teaching them the white, right way to walk before the Lord? Are we making those or allowing those compromises in character and moral character um, with our children? So, it, you know, that can be part of it. And, um, you know, as we see that confession, that repentance, we see that restored right relationship. So um, those are good things to look at as we begin to evaluate our homes, our communities, and asking the Lord, how do we, you know, how do we make things right? How do we begin to get to that place where we're back in that right relationship with you? How will that look in my community and in my home? What needs to be done? Amen. And not being afraid to walk in acts of obedience as the Lord gives us things to be obedient in. So let's, uh, let's end with prayer there. Lord, we thank you for such a high calling, such a high authority that you have given us. We ask now that you would help us to identify the things in our homes that are displeasing to you. Show us where the oppression is. Show us where the enemy has been trying to um, gain control in our lives. We ask that you would give us the victory over our enemy, Lord, whatever it is, um, whatever compromises, whatever sins, whatever um, things that are not of you that we've left untended, bring it to our attention that we may come back into that right relationship. And I ask that you would speak to us just as you did with Gideon, that each of us, you would show us, um, point out to us what we need to change and show us step by step what you desire us to do and how we can walk in obedience to your will. We ask this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's all for today, everybody. We'll see you next week on Rise Up. Good afternoon. Good day. Right.